The earliest event in the Saw timeline is the birth of John Kramer, aka Jigsaw, in 1953 or 1954. We know this because at the time of his death in 2006, they mention his age. The subject's name is John Kramer, a 52-year-old male Caucasian. Over the next 30 years, the Saw timeline is pretty uneventful, other than the birth of some major characters. We don't have exact dates for most of them, but based on their ages in the movies, I'd estimate that Lawrence Gordon was born in the 1950s, and Mark Hoffman, Eric Matthews, and Amanda Young were born in the 1960s. We do know that Hoffman's sister, Angelina, was born in 1971 or 1972, which we can deduce from a newspaper article showing that she was 25 at the time of her death in 1997. Then there's Logan Nelson, born August 18th, 1973, and Stephen Singh, born in 1975 or 1976 which we can do the math on based on his age at the time of his death in 2004. A raid that also resulted in the death of Tap's partner, 28-year-old Steven Singh. While the birth dates of these characters aren't super important to the story, I found that I can use similar logic to determine the dates of almost everything that happens in the series, and create the ultimate timeline that can help us better understand everything about the Saw lore and answer questions that have always confounded fans. So, if you want to know the date and order of events of everything in the franchise, stick around to the end of this video. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Jigsaw, the titular villain of the Saw saga, is most known for his puzzles. In order to solve many of his games and traps, you have to put together the puzzle pieces. I even did a character analysis episode where I put together the pieces of Jigsaw's life. Fittingly, the Saw timeline is also a puzzle. There are no title cards or graphics to display the dates, and the movies are known for their flashbacks within flashbacks and nonlinear storytelling. But there are clues hidden throughout about when certain things take place. If you want to know when Dr. Lawrence Gordon graduated from college, for example, you'll have to zoom into his diploma behind the desk, June 4th, 1979. This has led many Saw fans to wonder, what if you put everything in chronological order? Does the story still work? Or will this create paradoxes and contradictions? After all, if Dr. Gordon graduated when his diploma says he did, that makes him probably as old as John Kramer. What I've found is that for the most part, the Saw timeline is one of the most well thought out and accurate horror movie timelines out there. There are a few things that don't make sense, but most of them can be explained. Overall, the puzzle pieces actually fit together really nicely. And this was a really fun puzzle to solve. I know the Saw fans have been asking for this ever since I put together a timeline for my horror history episodes a few years ago. Since then, I've noticed some things and made this timeline even more accurate. So let's take it back to the next point of importance in the Saw story, the 1980s. It would have likely been somewhere around 1983 when Adam Stanhite, who would go on to be a photographer and one of John Kramer's many victims, got a preview of that pain on his sixth birthday. On my sixth birthday, my best friend at the time, Scott Tibbs, stabbed me with a rusty nail. I didn't tell you about that. Then there's the early career of Detective Mark Hoffman. Before eventually going on to be Jigsaw's first successor, he became a cop sometime in the early 1980s. I've been a cop for 20 years. John Kramer himself went on to be a civil engineer, creating his first building, the Gideon Meatpacking Plant, sometime in the mid to late 80s. Shortly after this, he teamed up with lawyer Art Blank to start the Urban Renewal Group to create low-income housing. One of these homes is the location later known as the Nerve Gas House. Meanwhile, one of Hoffman's earliest cases involved the investigation of an abusive teacher with his partner Daniel Rigg. Things escalate and Rigg punches the teacher, but avoids charges because Hoffman lies on his behalf. Don't get any ideas, no punching the horror history professor. That is, if you want to live. Sometime around 1990, Metropolitan Police Detective Eric Matthews and his wife have a son named Daniel. We don't have any clues to his date of birth other than the fact that he seems to be around 15 years old during the Nerve Gas House game in 2005. Around the time of Daniel's birth, the marital troubles start for Eric and his wife, likely due to Eric's infidelity. Sometime in the early 90s, John meets his future wife, Jill Tuck. Jill is a doctor who works with recovering drug addicts. She starts her own practice called Homeward Bound Clinic. The movie Homeward Bound was released in 1993, so one might assume that Jill was trying to capitalize off that popularity. It makes sense that this would also be around the time that she founded the clinic, which was opened before she got pregnant in 1993. The clinic's motto is cherish your life, a phrase that John would later repeat to some of his victims. No wonder they were soulmates. Jill holds a party at her clinic, where John meets insurance company mogul William Easton. John doesn't like how William uses a formula to determine who gets health coverage and essentially who lives and dies. John isn't a psychopath yet, so William avoids going on his list. For now. 
we'll revisit this. The reason that we know all of this takes place in the early 90s is because John and Jill plan to have a baby in the Chinese year of the pig. John plots it this way because the pig is a symbol of rebirth, which is central to both John and Jill's work. The year of the pig occurs every 12 years, meaning that these events occur in either 1995 or 2007. John does not survive to 2007, so it has to be 1995, meaning their son Gideon was likely conceived in April 1994, nine months before the Chinese New Year. While Jill is pregnant, John becomes increasingly concerned about her safety on the job, noticing some suspicious patients at her clinic, specifically a man named Cecil Adams, who John one day had to convince to put away his knife during an altercation. The incident foreshadows the tragic night where everything changes in November of 1994. We know this because John states that Jill was seven months pregnant at the time. This is my wife, she's pregnant. For far long, she's seven months. While Jill is locking up for the night, Cecil threatens her at knife point so that he can steal some meds. He storms out and slams the door into Jill's stomach, causing her to miscarry. The loss of his son devastates John, sending him into a dark depression where he distances himself from his wife and his work, causing his marriage to slowly fall apart. On January 31st, 1995, during the previously mentioned Year of the Pig celebration, John, donning a pig mask, kidnaps Cecil, making him his first victim. Just be glad he didn't choose Year of the Rooster, I guess. Those masks are strangely terrifying. Cecil awakens in John's workshop, where he takes part in John's first trap, the knife chair. He manages to escape that one, but he tries to retaliate, landing him in the razor wire cage, where he ultimately met his fate. This is where we first see John cut a jigsaw piece out of Cecil's body, which would eventually earn him the nickname Jigsaw, and inspire the 1997 Will Smith song, Getting Jiggy With It. All I can say is it better be in Saw X. Jill attempts to give John another chance after months of him distancing himself, and joined by Art Blank, she visits him at his workshop at Gideon Meatpacking Plant. John seemingly hasn't recovered at all and kicks them out. Jill tried to go back one more time alone, but didn't make any progress, and this was effectively the end of their relationship. I'm guessing these were still both in early 1995, because when Jill goes the second time, there are still reconnaissance photos of Cecil lying around. We can also see at this point he's already started working on designing some of the famous traps which he would use later on, such as the rack and the glass coffin. These traps almost never come to fruition then. Shortly after Jill leaves him, John is diagnosed with cancer. The combination of a miscarriage, divorce, and cancer diagnosis is too much for him to handle, and he decides to drive off a cliff and end his life. But against all odds, he survives, and this near-death experience makes him appreciate life in a way that he never had before. His faith in the rehabilitation method he had tried and failed on Cecil was restored. This was still nearly a decade before the events of Saw, but despite that, there are still a lot of events to unpack before that fateful day when he put himself face down on the bathroom floor. All of this talk of horror movie timelines reminds me, some of you who are struggling may want to get the timeline of your life back on track. That's why today's video is sponsored by BetterHelp, the online platform for professional therapy. It's secure professional therapy online, available worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your therapist. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room again. unless you want to. BetterHelp is all about facilitating therapeutic matches based on your needs, so they make it super easy to change therapists if needed. It's more affordable because you're not paying for the therapist's office space, and they even offer financial aid. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Just visit betterhelp.com slash ZZ's That's better H-E-L-P for 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash ZZ's World for 10% off. Take charge of your mental health now. Over the course of the next five to seven years, so basically 1995 through 2002, John began to pay more attention to the world around him as he continued to receive chemotherapy for his colon cancer. He came to meet some of the other people who he deemed as unappreciative of their lives and planned to include them in his upcoming test game. He also meets with his insurance provider, William Easton, to request coverage for an experimental cancer therapy in Norway. But his request is denied, and this time, William is added to his list. Told you it was coming back. While Jigsaw might mostly be laying low for a while, some other notable events happen during this time. In 1995 or 1996, Dr. Lawrence Gordon and his wife give birth to a daughter, Diana Gordon, which we know because she was eight years old at the time of the bathroom game. During the home invasion involving his wife and eight-year-old daughter. As previously stated, in 1997, Detective Hoffman's sister was murdered by her boyfriend, Seth Baxter, during a domestic dispute. We can see this date on a computer screen in Saw 5. Hoffman does not take this well and becomes an alcoholic, which in turn causes John Kramer to take notice of him as someone who is not cherishing life. As you may know, court cases can take as long as a year to resolve sometimes, and that's exactly what happens here. In 1998, Baxter was sentenced to 25 years in prison. However, he would be released early after serving only five years in 2003. And 2003 minus five years is 1998. 
1998. That's how I know when he was sentenced. Rounding out the millennium with 1999, this was most likely the year that Logan Nelson graduated from medical school and began his residency at the Angel of Mercy Hospital, where he would work under Dr. Gordon and cross paths with John Kramer. This is just me assuming that he went straight through school and did not take any breaks, which I believe is typical. Also in 1999, Hoffman saves the life of fellow Metropolitan Police Officer Matt Gibson from a junkie during a distress call at the Old Crossroad factory. Hoffman orders the perp to drop his gun, and he complies, but Hoffman shoots him anyway. Hoffman thinks he's doing a favor to Gibson, but Gibson reports Hoffman for... Brutality! Feels good to bring that one out again. About a year later, in 2000, Hoffman gets promoted for saving Gibson's life, while Gibson gets transferred to Internal Affairs, where he busted three of Hoffman's men. A year later, I transferred to IA, busted three of his guys. He swore he'd get me back. This is probably also around the time of various police brutality incidents on behalf of Detective Eric Matthews. What brutality! By 2003, John was deep into planning his first game, which would be a test game held in private. And just to clarify, a game is a test involving multiple people and multiple traps, while a trap is a single test involving one or more people. He had found four contestants for his game, and he would find his fifth before long when Logan Nelson accidentally switched up his x-rays with that of another patient, causing a delay in his treatment. This sealed Logan's fate as the fifth contestant, so in early 2003, John Kramer held his barn game. However, Logan didn't wake up in time for the beginning of the game, causing John to bail him out, not wanting Logan to die over an honest mistake. Technically, John Kramer's barn game could have taken place anywhere between John's cancer diagnosis and Logan's time in the military, so I'm putting it as late as possible in the timeline due to the presence of advanced technology. After saving his life, Jigsaw helped Logan rebound, and Logan became his first apprentice. Together, they created the reverse bear trap. After getting back on his feet, Logan served in the military as a medic and lieutenant. According to his file, he shipped out in May of 2003. There, he served alongside Keith Hunt. You two know each other? Logan was our medic in Fallujah. It was also around this time in 03 that Jigsaw must have conducted his earliest set of individual traps. But these, as far as we know, are never seen in any Saw movie. So how do I know that they happen? Well, this is right before Mark Hoffman attempted to create his own copycat Jigsaw trap, the Pendulum. The barn game was never discovered by police, so in order for this copycat crime to make sense, there had to have been other Jigsaw traps that were discovered by police in the first place, even though we don't see them on this list of Jigsaw victims in Saw 5. Maybe there's another page to this list that we don't see, or maybe they were all so badly mutilated that they could not be identified. There is actually further proof of their existence, though. In 2016, Logan Nelson created some new Jigsaw audio by splicing together audio from old tapes. This was before Voice.ai. He splices in words that aren't from any of the Jigsaw tapes that we've seen in Saw 1 through 7. The games have begun again, and they will not stop until the sins against the innocent are atoned for. I will take care of the next four. You take care of the rest. So this audio could have come from the extra victims in 2003, which had to happen before May 2003, the month that Seth Baxter was released from prison on a technicality. I know he was released in May because at the scene of his death in June, a detective states that he got out one month ago. Typical bio murder convict served five years, just released last month. But CZ, how do you know his death took place in June? Well, it's right here in the next day's newspaper, dated June 11, which would probably come out the day after, meaning Hoffman placed Seth Baxter in the pendulum trap on June 10th, 2003. But CZ, how do you know it's 2003 and not 2004? Because by 2004, Hoffman was already helping Jigsaw set up traps. The pendulum happened before Hoffman met Jigsaw, so it has to be 2003. I really did my homework this time. Obviously, it's shortly after the pendulum when John finds out about the copycat crime and punishes Hoffman for it with a trap called the shotgun chair. Hoffman is converted into a Jigsaw follower and would help out with future traps as John's physical condition continues to weaken. Next up, June 2003. John Kramer was diagnosed with an inoperable frontal lobe tumor. We know this because John's medical report, dated March 24, 2004, is shown and the initial diagnosis is said to be nine months earlier. So it's time for him to really get to work. He probably doesn't have long to live, and he's still got a lot of people to rehabilitate. In late February 2004, John, with Hoffman's help, kidnaps Paul Leahy and places him in the razor wire mills. You are a perfectly healthy, sane, middle-class male. Your last month, you ran a straight razor across your wrist. I'm no doctor, but it doesn't seem to me like Paul was a perfectly healthy and sane individual. As Paul bleeds to death in the trap, John and Hoffman observe through a peephole. This is also when John tasks Hoffman with placing Dr. Gordon's pen light at the scene of the next trap in order to throw off the police. I'm placing this in February 2004 because it's three weeks before police found Paul's body on March 19th, 2004. This one's not fresh anymore. At least three weeks out. The next subject would be Mark Wilson, who had to contend with the flammable jelly trap. They chose Wilson because he was faking an illness, and this would be the one where Hoffman left behind Dr. Gordon's pen light. I'm just kind of assuming that both of these traps occurred before police start finding stuff. They first find Paul on March 19th, then Mark shortly after that, finding Dr. Gordon's pen. 
John's medical situation continues to get worse on March 24th, 2004. He gets more cancerous growth that affects his ability to speak and move the right side of his body. But these ailments would not stop him from overseeing his most iconic trap yet. In May 2004, John would bring in two more Homeward Bound patients, Amanda Young and Donnie Greco, for his reverse bear trap. We know this date because Dr. Gordon cites that it was five months ago while he's chained up in the bathroom in October, which I'll get to. Amanda kills Donnie and takes the key from his stomach to unlock the trap. When Amanda gets out, she doesn't immediately go to police because we can see her wounds have healed a bit before then. The detectives soon bring in Dr. Gordon for questioning regarding his pen light at the crime scene, and Dr. Gordon confesses his whereabouts. He was having an affair. Immediately after, they interrogate Amanda, who praises Jigsaw for his rehabilitation methods. When she gets home after everything, John is there waiting for her. He takes her under his wing and brings her into Jill's clinic as evidence that his methods can turn a person's life around in ways that Jill's medical treatments could not. Amanda was proud to have recovered from her addiction even after Jill had given up on her. It works. It's real. He helped me. I'm sticking all these scenes together on the timeline because of the continuity with John being bald as he prepares for the bathroom game and Amanda's clothing and hair. Other events that summer include detectives Sing and Tap finding Jigsaw's workshop on Stygian Street only to discover it was a trap for them. Tap gets his throat slashed but lives, Sing isn't so lucky, and he's killed in the shotgun trap. Tap is discharged from the police force on June 21st, according to these signatures, but he becomes obsessed and decides to take the investigation into his own hands, renting an apartment across from Dr. Gordon and hiring a photographer named Adam to keep tabs on him. This is all part of the five months in between the reverse bear trap and the bathroom game. As I mentioned before, the bathroom game would be held in October 2004. Funny story, when I first started developing a Saw timeline a few years ago, I began by putting the bathroom game in October 2004 just as a placeholder because that's when the original Saw came out, and I built everything around that. Luckily, it ended up working perfectly in relation to all of the other dates, and I discovered that I got to keep it there. The movie came out October 29th, so although it's not a canon date, I like to imagine that that's when the bathroom game took place. Before everything goes in motion, John performs a rebirth ceremony, his own version of a baptism, asking Amanda to give everything to him, and assigning her her first task as a Jigsaw disciple, to go kidnap Adam. So Adam is kidnapped by Amanda, Dr. Gordon is kidnapped by someone, I don't think we actually know, and they are chained up in the dilapidated bathroom underneath the nerve gas house. Before the two contestants wake up, John and Amanda put the finishing touches on the game, with John staging himself as a dead man in the middle of the floor, and Amanda putting Adam into place in the bathtub. When Adam and Lawrence wake up, they discover the instructions. Gordon is supposed to kill Adam, and Adam is simply meant to escape. Neither one of them ends up succeeding, but Dr. Gordon does demonstrate his will to survive by cutting off his foot in order to try to get away. So, before he can fully escape, John catches up, congratulates him on surviving, and convinces him to become a Jigsaw apprentice. In the following days, Amanda feels guilty about Adam and returns to the bathroom to mercy kill him by suffocating him with a plastic bag. Adam would have starved to death before too long, so that's gotta be late October or early November. Not long after that, there's some activity overseas. Logan Nelson is still serving in the military and partakes in the Second Battle of Fallujah. This isn't shown in the movies, but it's a real battle that took place in November and December of 2004. You got captured, uh, but not before taking out three Taliban. Um, what I heard, they tortured the shit out of Gordon soon leaves his position at the Angel of Mercy Hospital to work at St. Eustace Hospital, presumably to distance himself from his co-workers, who would soon become Jigsaw victims. After the bathroom game, Jigsaw continues carrying out smaller traps. One of these, which must have been in late 2004 or early 2005, involved a woman named Joan, who went on television to tell her story. This inspires a man named Bobby Dagan to pretend to be a Jigsaw victim and write a book called Survive, which becomes a huge hit. John doesn't like the fact that Dagan is lying about becoming one of his victims, so he confronts him at a book signing. In fact, this must be 2005, entirely based on the fact that John Kramer is wearing a backwards hat at the age of 51. Or maybe the backwards hat is to indicate that he's a rebel, and he would soon demonstrate that. Remember how his healthcare insurance provider told him he couldn't seek outside treatment? He goes ahead and does it anyway, by seeking out that Norwegian doctor, Dr. Cecilia Peterson. She has a program outside Mexico City. After going through an operation, scans revealed that the tumor was never removed. They only pretended to cure him. John puts each of the people involved in the scam through a new game. Amanda Young also seems to be involved. Also sometime in 2005, Detective Eric Matthews files for divorce from his wife, which greatly harms his relationship with his son, who begins to act out by stealing and getting in trouble with the law. Matthews is also investigated by internal affairs around this time for various incidents of, say it with me, one, two, three, 
And speaking of which, we get more Logan Nelson updates. According to his file, he's released by Saddam Hussein loyalists in May of 2005. Then, in July, he returns from the military and goes into treatment for his PTSD for the next 23 months. In October, a documentary called Full Disclosure Report, Piecing Together Jigsaw, airs on TV. Hosted by the amazing and incredible Rich Skidmore, it goes over the mysteries of what happened the previous year and exposes the dark side of Eric Matthews. We know this program airs in October because of this line. On a chilly night one year ago, each mysteriously vanished. Some will try to say that Full Disclosure Report is not canon because the names Paul Stahlberg and Mark Rodriguez don't match up with their real names, Paul Leahy and Mark Wilson. But don't listen to them. This could be because middle names or pseudonyms are used for privacy reasons in the documentary. Don't you ever let anyone discredit Rich Skidmore. Anyway, that leads right up to the beginning of the next major game, the Nerve Gas House game. Hoffman helps John kidnap the test subjects and set them up in the house. All of these victims are people who detect Detective Matthews sent to prison by faking evidence, except for his son Daniel. Amanda is also in the game, and she's secretly a facilitator. Each participant learns that they're breathing in a poisonous gas and must solve puzzles around the house to win antidotes. By now, you're probably screaming at the video, wondering how I know the date of the Nerve Gas House game. Well, we know the date of Saw 4, it's in April 2006, and we know that the Nerve Gas House in Saw 2 was six months earlier. Eric's been missing for six months. This date also lines up really nicely with the decomposition of the bodies from the bathroom game. The last few contestants of the Nerve Gas game end up discovering the bathroom at the end, and Adam and Zepp are still there. I consulted a forensic subreddit providing photos of the corpses, and a forensic chem undergrad estimated that Adam had been rotting for one to two years. So everything lines up nicely. Anyway, it ends with Amanda saving Daniel with the antidote and transporting him to the Wilson Steel Plant where he's kept safe. The entire game was recorded on security cameras. The next day, Dr. Gordon helps John by performing surgery on police informant Michael Marks. Gordon stitches a key behind his eye, and this is the key to unlock the Venus Fly Death Trap mask. Sounds like it should be the name of a metal band. Michael is unable to get the key, so the mask clamps down on his face, and that's the end of Michael Marks. Detectives show up to the crime scene where there's a clue for Eric Matthews leading him to find the location of Jigsaw's hideout, the Wilson Steel Plant. And when they arrive, Eric and his team see the footage of the Nerve Gas House game, thinking that it was being broadcast live. While the signal is traced, Matthews tries to get answers from Jigsaw and grows increasingly impatient, which eventually turns to violence. This is not good for Eric, because this is actually his test, and he's failed. So, Jigsaw agrees to take him to the Nerve Gas House, where he's sedated by Amanda, and he wakes up with a chain around his ankle, just like Dr. Gordon and Adam a year earlier. But unlike Adam and Gordon, Matthews finds a way to escape without sawing off an appendage. It involves him breaking the bones in his foot. Once he escapes, he is confronted by Amanda, and she's not happy about his survival. <laughs> After a ruthless fight with the hobbled and broken Detective Matthews, Amanda gets the upper hand and leaves him for dead. However, someone, presumably John Kramer or Hoffman, ends up saving him and holding him captive in a cell where his only friend is this rat. However, Matthews did have someone looking for him on the outside. Scott Tibbs, a mentally insane pro-Jigsaw wannabe rocker, tries to make his own documentary on Jigsaw. He makes it to the press conference following John's escape from Wilson's steel plant and interviews a Detective Jenkins about the incident. He tries to visit Daniel Matthews in the hospital, but gets kicked out. Ironically, Daniel is a fan and probably would have liked a visit from him. Then, he tries to spread the word about Jigsaw, which doesn't work, so he makes his own Jigsaw trap and tries to test it on himself and dies. Nothing of value was lost that day. And that's the Scott Tibbs documentary, an often forgotten footnote in Saw lore. Obviously, he wasn't the only one looking for answers. Police were hard at work to locate one of their own. They kept Jigsaw's true identity under wraps for a month until November 30th, 2005, when it went public and was published in the Metro Gazette newspaper. I'd assume that after a month of searching with no answers, this was a desperate attempt to find Matthews. Meanwhile, back in John's camp, Mr. Kramer knew that his days were numbered and asked Dr. Gordon to recommend him a brain surgeon to buy him a little more time. Gordon recommended Dr. Lynn Denlin, who was perfect because she had ties to John's next big game. The calendar rolled over to 2006, but while the rest of us were distracted by bird flu and this trendy little new site called YouTube, John was planning his most complex games yet. He knew there was a good chance that he wouldn't survive this time around, so he recorded the tape for Jill, expressing his regret about how things ended. You can tell it was made in the operating room from Saw 3, while John still has his hair, but does not still have the bruises given to him by Matthews, meaning that this must have been recorded not long before he died. With Jigsaw's true identity out in the open, police tasked Hoffman with interrogating Jill Tuck Kramer, who is represented by John's former business partner, Art Blank. Blank is soon abducted and forced into a trap called the Mausoleum Trap with a man named Trevor. Dr. Gordon once again helps set this up, stitching Trevor's eyes shut and Art's mouth closed. Trevor dies and Blank survives, but Blank is forced to wear a device that'll sever his spine if he doesn't obey orders. This would come into play shortly. 
This time, there would be a few individual traps before the next big game. Detective Hoffman and the now promoted Detective Carey investigate the aftermath of the classroom trap, a trap set by Amanda and rigged to be inescapable. This leads to Amanda kidnapping Detective Carey and setting her up in another inescapable trap, the Angel Trap. Carrie's life is cut short in the Angel Trap on April 24, 2006, four days before she is discovered during the events of Saw 3 and 4. Carrie was gone for four days. Which means that it's April 28th when she is finally discovered. This date was one of the trickiest to determine, because at the end of Saw 4, we find out that the third and fourth movies took place simultaneously. These will be known as the Gideon Games, because the conclusion of both games takes place at Gideon Meatpacking Plant. And in the fourth movie, there's a forensics report matching Officer Daniel Riggs' fingerprints to a bullet found at the crime scene that day. The report is labeled April 28th, and this would be an anchor point for a lot of events, such as Hoffman meets FBI agents Perez and Strom at the site of the Angel Trap and they take over the investigation, looking for the accomplice that the Homicide Department couldn't find. Just hours before the Gideon games, Hoffman sets up Timothy Young in the rack. John gives him some engineering tips and Amanda taunts him, asking when his test will be. Get used to me, because I'm not going anywhere. You sure about that? John and Amanda then run into Jill, who begs John to stop what he's doing. John promises a way out for her when it's all over. He gives her a key necklace, telling her she'll know what to do with it when the time is right. Then, we can also assume Hoffman moved Eric Matthews out of his cell and onto a block of ice at Gideon Meatpacking Plant. This isn't shown, but it had to have been him. He also leaves a note for Amanda, letting her know that he's aware that she had something to do with the death of Gideon, John and Jill's miscarried son. Their rivalry intensifies. Finally, he visits Jigsaw one last time in the operating room and receives instructions for a future game, which would eventually be known as the Trial of the Fatal Five. Jigsaw was ensuring that his legacy would live on without him. With that, Hoffman goes to the other room and pretends to tie himself up next to Eric Matthews, while Amanda goes off to abduct Dr. Lynn Denlin so that she can perform the surgery on John. The simultaneous Gideon games involve two main trials, the trial of Jeff Denlin, Lynn's husband who never learned to move on after the death of their son, and the trial of Daniel Rigg, a SWAT officer whose obsession with saving those around him prevents him from living his own life. This is also secretly a test for Amanda to see if she can control her anger, seeing as how she's just been killing victims for the last couple traps now and not really giving them a chance to survive. At one point, Amanda, probably realizing that she'll fail, warns Lynn and Jeff's daughter not to trust the one who saves her, which she knew would be Hoffman. This was Amanda's way of getting revenge on Hoffman, as this message would make it back to the FBI and would be their first indicator that Hoffman could be corrupt. Anyway, just like all of the Chicago Bears head coaches in my lifetime, literally everyone fails. Amanda, Jeff, Lynn, Rig, Matthews, Art, and several less important characters all end up dead, as does the man himself, Jigsaw. But you already knew that. We literally started the video by saying he dies in 2006. The only meaningful survivor is Hoffman. When the FBI agent Strom comes snooping, Hoffman, fittingly wearing a pig mask, sneaks up behind him and gives him the old needle and puts him into the water cube trap. As predicted by Amanda, Hoffman saves Lynn and Jeff's daughter and is hailed as a hero. However, he's shocked to find out that Strom survived his trap as well. Strom had used a pen to poke a hole in his trachea, apparently allowing him to breathe through his neck. Should have filled it with milk, Hoffman. Rookie mistake. And speaking of mistakes, there's definitely one here in the timeline, during the autopsy of John Kramer. An autopsy is usually performed the next day after a death, and thanks to Strom and Hoffman being collected by ambulances, they would have found Kramer and the other bodies immediately. So one would assume that John's autopsy would occur the next day, April 29th, 2006, right? The problem is that the date on John's autopsy tag is October 21st, 2006. See, it's right there. It doesn't take six months to do an autopsy, and judging by the lack of decomposition on John's body, it hasn't been very long since he died. So that means one of these death dates, April 28th or October 21st, has gotta be wrong, and all we can do is speculate on which one. Obviously, I think this one is wrong, and John's death was in April. Here's my rationale. We later see Hoffman looking at evidence bags containing Strom's cell phone and the pen he used to poke the hole in his neck. Those give us a month and a day when the evidence was collected, May 7th, and the day that the evidence was moved to storage, which appears to be July 7th. So if the evidence was collected on May 7th, that means they were collecting evidence from the warehouse for the next nine days after the Gideon games. So the October 21st tag doesn't make any sense. Maybe Logan Nelson's cousin was in charge of putting the tags on and uh, just put the wrong date or something. In the meantime, John's executor calls up Jill and shows her the final video recording that John left for her and gives her this box. This could have taken place anywhere from May 8th, 2006 to sometime in July 2006. All we know is that an executor must wait at least 10 days before probating the will in New Jersey, where these movies take place. And when we next see Hoffman, it must be July 2006, because this is the same day that we see the evidence bag, which says that the evidence was moved to storage on July 7th. And this is storage, so July 7th is already in the past. There are a few things to note from this time period. Hoffman is promoted for his heroics, and FBI agent Perez is pronounced dead from her injuries sustained during the Daniel Rigg trial. 
But in reality, the Bureau is faking her death for her own safety. Soon, they would discover the true nature of what they're up against. John Kramer may be gone, but Jigsaw lives forever through the work of his followers. While Hoffman starts preparing the next game, he receives an anonymous letter claiming to know who he really is. This letter was sent by Dr. Lawrence Gordon, who Hoffman doesn't know about, so he suspects it's from Special Agent Strom, who basically accuses him of being John Kramer's accomplice. Look at you. A couple of scratches and a story about how your arm straps broke Jigsaw doesn't make mistakes. Strom follows up on this theory by doing a deep investigation of his own into Hoffman, which is the inspiration behind one of my favorite Letterboxd reviews. This movie is about a detective figuring out the plots of Saw 3 and Saw 4. In the meantime, Hoffman cuts the ribbon on the next major game, The Trial of the Fatal Five. These subjects were all involved in allowing a building fire to occur years ago and to be covered up, which furthered their own careers at the expense of others. Their tests were created for them to work together in order to survive. As this is going on, Hoffman makes contact with Special Agent Strom's superior, Special Agent Erickson, or as I like to call him, J. Jonah Erickson. <laughs> He starts to plant the seeds in Erickson's head of Strom possibly being Jigsaw's other accomplice. He sets things up at the location where the Fatal Five game is being held to make it look like Strom was behind it all. A crap. 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 Mega crap. So, after luring Strom into a trap, the glass coffin trap, Strom fails to follow directions and gets crushed by the collapsing room while Hoffman is carried to safety. That is where Saw 5 ends and Saw 6 begins, but timeline-wise, we're staying right here in July 2006. Saw 6 would take place less than a week later. Just this past week, a new so-called game was discovered with grisly results. If that's not enough proof for you, consider the fact that Hoffman retrieves Strom's hand and uses it to place fingerprints at various crime scenes, like the next trap, the Pound of Flesh trap. If it were any longer than a week later, the hand would already be starting to decompose. At the crime scene following the Pound of Flesh, J. Jonah Erickson admits that they faked Agent Perez's death. So, you know those flowers that you never sent the grieving family? Don't bother. The two would continue their investigation, despite Strom looking very guilty at this point. There were still a couple more games that John wanted his followers to carry out after his death. Remember his old friend William Easton, the health insurance guy? He was about to get his comeuppance. The instructions for this game were originally in the hands of Jill, left behind in the box that he left for her in his will. But Hoffman shows up at her practice and usurps control, because Hoffman is a megalomaniac. So the next game would be held at Rowan Zoological Institute and feature William Easton being forced to make the same kind of life or death decisions about who will receive healthcare coverage only now in person regarding his own employees. You know this one's gonna be spicy. Meanwhile, in the background, Erickson and Perez discover that the knife used to cut the jigsaw piece from the latest victim matches the knife used to cut the jigsaw piece from Seth Baxter, but doesn't match any of the other victims. Their suspicion of Hoffman continues to grow as they learn that Strom's fingerprints were placed after he was already dead, and eventually, they descramble the voice on the Seth Baxter jigsaw tape, revealing none other than Detective Mark Hoffman. Right now, you're feeling helpless. Hoffman is forced to kill all three FBI agents. He burns down the field office, once again marking the place with Strom's fingerprints. Which I just realized doesn't make that much sense, because you'd think the FBI will be able to analyze the fingerprints again and determine that they were planted there post-mortem. In the meantime, Jill drops off a tape at Dr. Gordon's office at St. Eustace Hospital, one of John's secret final requests. Then, she goes to the zoo and places a copy of Hoffman's note to Amanda, essentially letting him know that he's in trouble, because there shouldn't be anyone who knows about this. When he sits down in his chair, Jill activates a shock device. He's incapacitated, and she puts him in a new reverse bear trap and leaves him for dead. Hoffman does manage to escape, but it still does some damage, ripping open his cheek, which he stitches back together in a new hideout later that week. Finally, after spending four straight movies in 2006, there is another time skip. Hoffman goes into hiding for eight months, not emerging again until March 2007. This date is a little easier to figure out. During the hunt for Hoffman, one of the police computers displays an email with the date March 12, 2007. Most of Saw 7 takes place the same day, but there are a couple of things that take place before that. The first is the public execution trap, where two men caught in a love triangle must decide who will be eliminated in front of a live audience at a shopping center. This is an interesting one to play. Legend has it that this scene was originally going to show John and Dr. Gordon spectating in the crowd. This would place it pretty far in the past, but since it's not in the movie, I'll assume it's meant to take place closer to the rest of Saw 7 in early 2007. Looking at weather patterns, I see people wearing jackets and hats, which would put us closer to the other scenes, like Jill's Dream, where we see snow, and Bobby Dagan's Abduction, where we see his breath. Personally, I'm placing the public execution trap in March 2007. 
It also makes sense there, because Hoffman's return would probably spark Jill to fear for her life again and go seek protection from Matt Gibson, the internal affairs detective from Hoffman's past. If we're putting the public execution trap in March, then we also have to put the next scene, Bobby Dagan's TV interview, in March as well. After that, we have the car trap, which is the same day as that March 12th email that I mentioned earlier, so the rest of the Saw Saga is pretty easy to place. The car trap is designed to bring retribution to a group of racists. Bobby Dagan hosts a self-help group for Jigsaw survivors, which is remarkable, just remarkable. Promotional. And after this, Bobby is kidnapped and placed in the Clear Dawn Hospital game, where he and his team are ironically forced to survive a jigsaw game, much like Bobby claimed he had in his book. Meanwhile, through a series of clues, Hoffman leads Matt Gibson to his hideout, where a motion-activated turret is waiting for him, and Hoffman finally gets the revenge he promised all those years ago. Hoffman hides inside of a body bag to sneak his way into the police station, where he takes out many officers en route to the last person he needs to get revenge on, Jill Tuck. He sets her up in an old classic, The Reverse Bear Trap, and third time's a charm with that device. Finally, after seven movies, we get to see it tear someone's face apart from the inside, and it is so satisfying. But Hoffman is still on the loose. He packs up some money and guns so he can start a new life, and it blows up his hideout in the air hangar. But he's intercepted by Jigsaw's greatest asset, Dr. Lawrence Gordon, and two more unknown apprentices in pig masks. After sedating Detective Hoffman, well, I guess we can't call him that anymore, I assume he's fired, but after sedating Hoffman, Gordon locks him inside the bathroom. Yes, that bathroom, but this time with no chance to escape. Game over. And for a while, it was game over. But aren't you forgetting about someone? One month later, conveniently missing out on the whole bloody Saw saga, Logan Nelson would be released from his PTSD treatment by Dr. Perry. But I would say that he was anything but cured. On October 5th, 2007, Logan Nelson was awarded a Purple Heart, an award given to US military personnel who were wounded or killed in battle. For the next eight years, there are no Jigsaw-related killings that we know about, and things would go back to normal. But normal doesn't necessarily mean quiet. We don't know exactly when, but Logan got the job as the medical examiner at St. Peter's Hospital. From this position, he would see a lot of incompetence from the local detective, Brad Halloran. Criminals seemed to go free, while many innocent people ended up dead on Logan's table. In 2009, on the south side of the city, a new Metro Police detective named Zeke Banks was partnered with Officer Peter Dunleavy. Under a policy called Article 8, cops had the power to do essentially whatever they wanted in the name of stopping crime, which led to a lot of corruption in the force. One day, Dunleavy shot a witness who was planning to testify against another officer just to keep him quiet. The victim's son, William Emerson, witnessed the crime and came to praise Zeke when he did the right thing by reporting Dunleavy to internal affairs. I'm putting this in 2009 because it's 12 years before the main events of Spiral in 2021. It's been 12 years. Yes, 12 fucking years. 12 years ago, I turn in a dirty cop. I get a medal for it. Big fucking deal. Well, at one point, the son, William Emerson, says it's 15 years. I've been loyal to you since the first day we met, 15 years ago the day your partner killed my father. So it looks like another error there, but I'm gonna assume it's 12 years because that's said more often, and also 15 years doesn't make sense. That would put the Dunleavy incident in 2006, and we never saw any of those characters during the Saw saga. Hoffman even claimed that he was the last one left at one point. In 2011, a degenerate gambler named Malcolm Neal was partially responsible for the death of his wife when people he owed money broke into his home and slit Mrs. Neal's throat. This put him in Logan's bad graces. It must have happened in 2011 because it's stated to be five years before the main events of Jigsaw, which are most likely in 2016. Malcolm Neal, I remember that case. His wife was murdered five years ago. Malcolm Neal probably wasn't enough to convince Logan to hold his own Jigsaw game, but what would happen next would. In 2014, Logan's wife, Christine Nelson, was killed by a loose meth addict named Edgar Munson. Not to be confused with the burnout Eddie Munson from Stranger Things. To make matters even worse, Munson was free because of a failed conviction by Detective Halloran. 2014 is two years before the main events of Jigsaw. It's been two years since Christine passed. This was probably the tipping point, and Logan decided to recreate John Kramer's barn game to punish Halloran and test himself to see if he could be as good of a jigsaw as his master. So in 2016, he holds his own, which I'll call Logan Nelson's barn game. Because what the fuck else would I call it? This is stated several times to be 10 years after John's death. Kramer's been dead for 10 years. John Kramer's dead and has been for 10 years. This is a blood sample 
perp taken a decade ago. There's a bit of a contradiction when Nelson says that John's original game, which he did as a secret test before all the other games, was 10 years ago. Jigsaw died three years after John Kramer's barn game, so they can't both be 10 years ago. It's likely that Nelson was generalizing. He was essentially saying this was all about a decade ago. Or maybe his PTSD from the war has really affected his math skills. Actually, we kind of know that he's using the term 10 years ago kind of loosely, because he also says this. 10 years ago, I came out of the war a broken man. Except his file says that he came out of the war in 2005, so clearly Nelson is just clumping that whole time period between 2003 and 2006 together in his mind. Anyway, Nelson puts three contestants in his version of the barn game and deposits the bodies in public for Halloran to find after each death. Each of them is someone connected to Halloran's past cases. He also ends up framing Halloran by leaving the puzzle pieces in his freezer and leading him to the pig farm where the two of them would be the final players. And Halloran is scared into confessing all of his dirty police work, which Logan gets an audio recording of. Some will think it's Jigsaw. Some will suspect you. But no one will suspect me. And with all the evidence he needs, Logan slices Halloran's head into seven pieces with this laser cutter device. He would not be the only person to try to hold his own jigsaw games, however. William Emerson, the boy who watched his father fall to the corrupt police force, was grown up and wanted revenge. That takes us to Spiral, where corrupt police officers on the Southside Metro PD come to find themselves one by one caught in a series of traps. I'm placing the beginning of Spiral on July 4th, 2021. The July 4th part is obvious. It happens during an American Independence Day celebration. My calculations on the year are a little uh, less scientific. At one point, we see the file of Detective Marv Boswick, and it says he was born on May 9th, 1981. The actor that played Marv, Daniel Petroyanevi, was also born in 1981, and he doesn't appear to be aged up or aged down in makeup. He's just playing his actual 40-year-old self. Also, Spiral came out in 2021, so it's pretty easy to assume that this is when it was set. Anyway, Marv is killed in the subway trap on July 4th. The next day is July 5th, and Zeke is forced to team up with rookie detective William Shank. This is William Emerson, the new Jigsaw, but he changed his name so that nobody would make the connection. As they delve deeper into the case, they uncover a dark web of corruption within the police force, and more and more crooked cops are put into Jigsaw traps. Zeke takes the lead on the case. They question Boswick's morning wife, and during some late-night research, another cop named Fitch is put into the finger trap. The next day is July 6th. Fitch's fingers are discovered at a freeway underpass along with a new message from the new Jigsaw, and the body is later found at a bread factory. Zeke and Shank investigate a drug dealer who may have ties to the case, and they question Zeke's old partner, Dunleavy. That night, Zeke's father, a former cop, also goes missing. And our last date on the timeline, for now, is July 7th. And I know I've been counting correctly, because we can see the date is 7-7 on a security camera feed. Shank doesn't show up for work that day, and police receive a new package containing skin with Shank's tattoo. A body is discovered at a local butcher shop, and they assume that it's Shank. The police chief is then attacked in the evidence room and put into the wax trap. Zeke continues to search for his dad, but he's kidnapped by someone in a pig mask and finds himself in a series of tests in an abandoned soap factory. As you can probably guess, I'll refer to this as the soap factory game. At the end, he finds Shank alive, and to his surprise, Shank wants to team up with him. His proposal is for Zeke to help him find the dirty cops, and Shank would give them Jigsaw-style punishments. He brings him to the final test, where Zeke finds his dad in the IV drip trap. Zeke must decide between stopping Shank or freeing his dad. In the end, Zeke saves his dad, but Shank has a backup plan. When the SWAT team cuts down the door, it triggers a machine that puppeteers Mr. Banks to look like a threat, and they're all forced to shoot him down. In all of the commotion, Shank gets away. So there are now at least three jigsaws running around out there. Dr. Gordon, Logan Nelson, and William Emerson, aka William Shank. In the end, there was just one scene that I absolutely couldn't place. In Saw 7, during the survivor support group, we meet a new survivor named Sydney, who tells about her experiences in the lawnmower trap. There's no indication of when this happened, but if I had to put it somewhere, I would put it in the first quarter of 2006, before the classroom trap or the angel trap. Maybe Amanda put Sydney in the lawnmower trap, and she was frustrated when Sydney survived, and that's why she decided to make future traps inescapable. So that's the Saw timeline as it currently stands. It's not perfect by any means, but there are really only a few major contradictions that can't be explained. You could argue that there shouldn't have been HD TVs in some of the flashback scenes before HD was popular, but technically it was possible. I think after Saw X, there's really no room in the timeline to do anything with John Kramer, but as Eleanor so eloquently explained, Jigsaw lives forever through the work of his followers. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with our current surviving Jigsaws and who might take up the mantle next. I've got individual analysis episodes on each of John Kramer's devoted followers, as well as some other Saw characters. You can find them in that playlist on the left. For all things Saw, make sure you subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for all notifications, and I'll see you in the next next one, assuming we both survive.